If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. When Mikolash was cut down and the Good Hunter continued their ascent through the nightmare of Mensis, the cries of a baby began to ring out. But what is a baby doing here? Why is the ancient Thumerian queen Yarnum here? She looks up, not acknowledging the hunter. Nearby is something most precious to her, something that she's been denied. Nearby is the answer to what Yarnum cries over, an empty stroller. It's her Mergo, but she can't go to the child, so the hunter approaches in her stead. Mergo was put into the care of another. Its father, formless Odin, perhaps dictated this to be in an effort to keep it alive. Though Mergo itself is a great one, so one could believe that Mergo itself dictated this being to act in its mother's stead. Regardless, remember, the children of the Great Ones never live to be born. So the Great One seeks a human surrogate to carry their children. Mergo is the product of this, and when it was taken from Yarnum, it went into the care of another cosmic being who acts as Mergo's wet nurse. And she's beautiful, isn't she, in a way? Whatever called the wet nurse to perform its duty chose wisely. There's no amount of insight that could reveal the true face of the wet nurse. She does everything in her power to protect the formless Mergo, even keeping it away from its mother. The hunter is no longer a fresh combatant and engages this beautiful, mighty being in a fight that carries on for what feels to be hours. She dances and spins, brings darkness over the arena, attacks us too to ambush them. Ultimately, for better or worse, the hunter takes the upper hand and dispatches the wet nurse. Nearby, little Mergo cries for a bit, though only for a few moments before the baby goes silent. Yet more time passes and the faint weeping of Queen Yarnum also ceases. Then it is made known, the nightmare has been slain. With the wet nurse no longer taking care of Mergo, one may choose to believe that Yarnum is finally able to approach her child, to take Mergo away, to be free of this place, thus ending the nightmare of Mensis. Another piece of an umbilical cord is left behind part of a child great one that the hunter has seen before. They now possess two of them. There is one more thing that needs addressing before departing from this wretched place. The good hunter remembers something in the upper level of the school, attacking on the bridge, inciting madness to those who approach the loft. And they have a pretty damn good idea of where they were attacking from. So, a little detour before departing, back to the middle level of Mergo's loft to find them. It's a nightmare run to make. There are maddening creatures all across the bridges here that incite a frenzy on those exposed to them for too long. But eventually the hunter finds a lever, and a lever seen must be a lever pulled. It just so happens to drop something suspended in a tower down into a pit, and it looks fleshy. That was what was inciting the frenzy, but we can't just leave it be, can we? Following it down into the pitch black of the loft's underbelly isn't a positive feeling. It's quite terrifying, actually. If it weren't for the light on the lift, it'd be impossible to make heads or tails of it, but just a few steps away is the brain of Mensis. And while it is absolutely rotted, it's not hostile. It doesn't do anything except lie there. It's many eyes not even tracking the intruder. This was a great one found within the nightmare by the school, albeit a flaccid and weak thing that can't even lift itself. The school let it be, studied it as best they could, but the brain did little more than exist and use frenzies against perceived threats. The hunter's final order of business here is to kill this awful thing, and then get the hell out. With the end of Mensis, the hunter has choices to make. Within the hunter's dream, the workshop now burns, the end of the night and therefore the hunt is nearing. The doll tells the hunter that Garamond is waiting them at the foot of the great tree, but there are still unanswered questions in areas not yet seen. The hunter is not yet ready to end their hunt, so Garamond must wait for now. Until dawn has drawn just a bit closer, the hunt isn't over yet. There's still work to be done. Back in the Odin Chapel, the woman Ariana is gone. She'd been feeling so sick the last time the hunter had seen her. She wouldn't have been foolish enough to venture outside during the hunt, so they look around the chapel to see if they can find her, and they do, indeed. Beneath it, sitting in a chair looking absolutely devastated, the tiny body of a newborn Great One at her feet. The Great Ones seek out surrogates to carry their children. Ariana had special blood, possibly a strong Thumerian bloodline. She was chosen to carry, and it was a pregnancy that happened far too quickly. What Ariana was forced to give birth to is a terrible little thing that chirps at her feet. She half weeps and laughs at what's happened. 
Her wits are starting to leave her. She's cracking. So the hunter makes a terrible choice, one that is not theirs to make, but the hunt is drawing to its end. The hunter snuffs out this new life, killing the newborn Great One, not knowing that it would kill Ariana as well. The Lady of the Night is dead as is that baby, and left behind as a piece of its own tiny umbilical cord. The hunter now has three fragments. There's no time to see to Ariana's body. They have to move on. The nun Adela is just wildly laughing to herself now, no longer speaking. Concern for Yosefka and her patients is starting to grow as she hasn't been answering her door, and she has potentially a very dangerous man in there with her. There was a secret path through the old forest near Bergenworth. It wasn't necessary to use before, but now it feels like a proper time to be and e into that clinic. There is an odd number of human corpses littering the path there, though. It's a long run, but when the Good Hunter arrives, the back door to the clinic is busted out and the halls are empty, save two celestial creatures roaming the halls and a third lying on a table long dead, looking to be the victim of experimentation. Upstairs, a woman writhes, clad in the garb of the church. Who she truly is at this point doesn't matter. All that were in the clinic, save her, are now dead. She says that she's sick, something is within her, and it proves that she is no beast. She's chosen. She's more than those around her. Like Ariana, she is with Celestial Child, soon to give birth. Whatever happened here, it's wrong. It's sinister. It's in defiance of what's good in this world. So the hunter strikes the woman down, ending her bid to bear the child of a great one and stopping a potential disaster from being buried into Yarnum. From her body falls another piece of the umbilical cord. Whether it was from her or a piece taken from Koss's umbilical cord is hard to say. And again, it doesn't really matter. The hunter now possesses four parts of an umbilical cord. Leaving the clinic takes the hunter near where they first woke up, what now feels like an eternity ago. It takes them to the door where they stood and they spoke with Yosefka at the start of the hunt. Now, another celestial creature stands in the corner. The hunter cuts them down, and from their body they take a vial of Yosefka's blood. Whoever that was upstairs writhing in pain was almost certainly not the true Yosefka. This was her, or what remained of her. Yosefka's clinic has fallen. It probably did quite some time ago, the hunter just wasn't aware of it. They'll leave this place to be claimed by the beasts. There's nothing more to be done here. Before leaving the district for one last time, the hunter stops by the window of Father Gascoigne's daughter just to check on the girl, make sure that she's all right. But within, a man's voice returns their knock, and the hunter's heart sinks into their chest. Her fate is entirely unknown to them, because the man inside will only speak to them of the hunt. The girl isn't heard. It's hard to pay attention to what the male voice is saying, but at the end, he tells them to go to the right of the great cathedral and look for an ancient shrouded church, then gifting them a tonsil stone. It sounds like a trap. Every time someone speaks, it sounds suspicious and malicious now, but fine, why not? Off to be a pawn in someone else's strange game. Off to kill something else, no doubt. Following the instructions of where that intruder in the window told the hunter to go, lands them in the grasp of one of the amygdala, but not smothered to death. Rather, taken to a peculiar lecture hall, tucked away within the remnants of Mensis. The hunter has been here before, en route to the nightmare of Mensis. But before they didn't find something, here there's an intriguing fellow named Patches, the spider. He sounds quite a lot like the intruder the hunter had just heard in Father Gascoigne's home, and he's surprised to see the good hunter here, alive and he's needy and talkative. He really tries to make sending the hunter into the arms of an amygdala seem like it was a gift that he gave them, not an attempt to get them squished by a space puppy. This sniveling creature serves the amygdala as though they were gods, though he doesn't really seem too attached to them. He speaks of the amygdala as though they were a singular creature, something that the hunter doesn't quite understand, at least not yet. But you know, God, there's just something about this Patch's character. Flashbacks to other lives. The hunter sees themselves being kicked from behind down a pit, being lowered into a giant's arena, being locked in a tower. It's like they've met this fellow before, and the sword just kind of starts swinging itself. Alas, another innocent life taken during the terrible hunt. Oh no, he's probably fine. Actually, don't feel too bad for him. He bounces. At the end of the lecture hall is a strange door that leads to a stranger place. This is the Nightmare Frontier. It seems like a land out of place, because there's not much here that seems to connect it to Yarnum or its surrounding areas. But what calls this place home is a very hostile amygdala that is all too willing to raise arms against the hunter, and it puts on display just how terribly powerful these creatures truly are. If they chose to act against humanity, it would be a swift crushing of them. But the reasoning of the Great Ones is impossible to know. 
Why the other amygdala are widely docile, yet this one is violent, is hard to say. Killing it is not required of the hunter. They could choose to leave the nightmare frontier, leave this amygdala alone. But too much has been seen during this hunt to leave any of these great ones alive. If they are within reach, they will be cut down. And this one is no different. With that errand complete, back within Yarnum, as the dawn approaches, there are a few more loose ends that the good hunter cannot seem to figure out. Calling upon the older hunter, they guide them towards the upper level of the Healing Church workshop, to a weird statue in the Hemwick Tarna Lane, and then to a courtyard left of the Odin Chapel, with the promise of assistance should the need arise. So, first the hunter returns to the Healing Church workshop, and instead of traveling down the tower, they climb it. You see, they've long since had the key to open the door at the top, they just didn't realize it. And through the top of the tower, they find themselves within the upper cathedral ward, the orphanage. But any children that once suffered here are long since gone. Either tiny failed experiments or worse. The orphanage itself is overrun with beasts, Thimerian humanoids, and members of the choir now changed into cosmic horrors. And as they push through the darkness of this prison, they find a sad gathering of the children. Now celestial minions that congregate around their celestial emissary in a garden of lumen flowers that haven't yet bloomed. Nothing about this feels good, but it's, it's also difficult to look at these beings and see children, which makes it easy to cut through them. Another product of this city's cruelty ended, another experiment that can never be repeated. And not far away is another innocent that cannot be allowed to continue. Deeper within the choir's domain is the Great One who did not ascend, Ebrietis, the daughter of the cosmos. She was left behind in the ancient times of the Thimerian Labyrinth, found by the Healing Church, the source of knowledge that led to blood ministration. Without Ebrietus, the blood may have run dry long ago. The city may not have fallen. The blood of the Healing Church a scarce thing for the wealthy few. Ebrietus is not hostile to the hunter's approach. She seems to be resting before a strange altar, upon it a creature that quite looks like Rom. And, quite like Rom, Ebrietus only acts against the invaders once they themselves strike against her. This seems a cruelty. Imagine all the hunter could learn from Ebrietus had they the ability to understand her. But that curiosity is precisely what led to this whole mess. With elder hunters at their side, the hunter brings down this beautiful god that never was. With Ebrietus gone, the secrets of blood ministration can never be rediscovered and acted upon. One less kin to the Great Ones to plague this land. There's nothing more to be done here. A weird statue near Hemwick, hmm? That was where the older hunter had directed them to go next. Back in Yosefka's clinic, they'd found a summons addressed specifically to them for a place called Canehurst. Alfred had mentioned that place. He seemed really passionate about it. Was that letter on the hunter when they first came into Yarnum? Was that why it was addressed to them? Did Yosefka take it while they were sleeping before the hunt even began? It's impossible to remember. Actually, the hunter can't seem to remember anything about their life before the hunt. And, well, sure enough, at the weird statue in Hemwick, a chariot pulls up. And does it make sense? Well, no, and, and it really doesn't need to. This is a first-class ride to none other than Castle Canehurst itself, or what remains of it. The executioners raided this place a long time ago, and they killed everyone within. What remains now are raging spirits and terrible vile blood creatures. The castle itself holds a beauty about it and a deep sense of heritage and history, but its residents betray that something truly awful happened here long ago. High atop the castle, sitting atop a throne that is not his, rests the husk of a long past hero to some and terror to others, the martyr Logarius, with that crown of illusions upon his head. He's lived far longer than any human should, kept alive by matters decided in speculation, but he's here, and he still guards the way to the undying queen Annalise. Ligarius proves to be a vicious fight on the rooftops, even after all these centuries passed. In his prime, he must have been a true shining example of the old hunters. It's no wonder that Alfred so idolized him and his executioners, but he is a relic of the past, not something meant to exist in these times, and he prevents passage to the queen. The martyr is finally killed before that which he guarded for so long and taken from his head is the crown that holds closed the path forward. Donning the crown of illusions reveals the throne room of the vile blood queen. Within is a pathetic sight. She really is all that remains of Kanehurst. 
her subjects replaced by statues from long past, the seat of her king empty beside her. She welcomes the hunter in, under no illusion as to the state of her home. She is all that remains, but still demands that she be treated with the respect of a queen. Any hunter who carries themselves humbly before her may enter her service as a vile blood, to consume her corrupted blood and take an oath against the church. This will certainly be a long and joyful agreement. While poking around the statues of the throne room, the good hunter chances across an unopened summons to Canehurst. So they just slip it into their pocket while Annalise isn't looking. Who could this possibly be for? So many of the hunters met throughout the night have either moved on or became really, really dead. All that immediately comes to mind is Alfred. He might also want to know what became of Logarius as well. Maybe he would find it all to be very interesting, something worth taking note of. Alfred is back in the city, in the same spot he's been for most of the night. And sure enough, he does indeed have an interest in that summons. Not just to study it, though. He says that he will depart for Canehurst soon. Even though it's extremely dangerous, the man has made his decision. He's a grown boy, so the hunter leaves him to his venture. But, ah, uh, you know, out of intrigue or perhaps concern, the hunter doesn't make it far before they decide to go and check on Alfred at Canehurst. The flow of time becomes strange when using the messenger lamps to get around the city, so Alfred is already long gone when the hunter starts porting around. So they go back to the castle to look for the wannabe executioner, and they find him in the throne room. Seems there was more to Alfred than what first met the eye. He's disturbingly elated at his deed. He's torn apart the queen. Though she's not dead, she cannot die. Alfred is none the wiser, and he rejoices at the violence that he's brought. This was really not expected, and the sort of thing that is becoming of a blood-drunk hunter on the brink of transformation. The sight of it is too disgusting to allow unchecked, so Alfred will be the next to die this night. This is where the executioners will finally completely die out. Logarius will not be canonized as a true martyr. Alfred will not be allowed to create a new terrible mythos around them. The hunter kills Alfred and leaves his corpse next to the Pope of the Undying Queen. Let her sort it out, if she ever can. The hunter's business within Canehurst is concluded. Back to the city for the final lead from the old hunter. The graveyard beside Odin Chapel. An amygdala creeps atop the cathedral ward and is waiting next to the chapel for someone to come within its reach. Though... The hunter has the eye of a blood-drunk hunter on their persons, a weird gift from the little messengers that they were too polite to turn down. They just seemed so happy to give it to them. But with that eye in their possession, the amygdala does not crush them. Rather, they send them someplace new. A curse upon fiends and their offspring sings into the night, and the hunter awakens to find themselves in a time apart, a plane away. The hunter's nightmare. Though not blood drunk nor deceased, the little messengers have decided that there are certain hunters worthy of entering this place unanchored, though the reason has yet to be seen. The hunter calls for the aid of an elder hunter once again, and as a group they set out into this new, final nightmare. This is where hunters from all the ages of Yarnum find themselves when the violence of the hunt calls too deeply to them, when they become blood drunk, when they die during the night, when they become beasts themselves. A special cursed place, created by a great one whose body and child were desecrated on a faraway shore, created out of rage and hatred towards hunters and their trade. A deserving place for those that prowled and cold in Yarnum. It's dry and overgrown here, devoid of any potential comforts that could soothe a tired hunter. It's one fight after the next, the purest of hunts. But the landscape is familiar, the cathedral ward is still very recognizable, and after a long night of traveling around the city, it's easy to make heads and tails of what's what. In the Grand Cathedral, where the Vicar Amelia once prayed and then raged, another beast lays upon the altar. But it doesn't respond to the hunter's approach, it just rests on the altar. In its hand is a pendant that will unlock ways forward in the hunter's journey, almost a gift of sorts from the creature, almost. But best not to disturb, it's wholly unresponsive anyways. For now, at least, the two hunters push farther into the city. The pendant mentions crossing a river of blood, and soon what that is becomes very clear. So much violence has taken place that the water in this nightmare has turned to blood. There are corpses all around the canals where monstrous, blood-consuming beasts lurk. Hunters of the past have piled on numbers of dead as well, but none of them. More than the one who now rests nearby in the bowels of a looming construct. A shuddering corpse calls to the hunter from a pile of dead, begging for help in delivering a warning that Ludwig the Accursed the first of the church hunters, former hero and head figure of the healing church, approaches. 
In life, he overconsumed of blood, became a terrifying and new type of beast that Eileen the Crow, an elder hunter of old, had to see put down. Lawrence and Ludwig were both warnings to the church of what was to come, but they were warnings that were not heeded. When Ludwig was slain, he passed into the hunter's nightmare, eternally imprisoned within his body and in the mind of a maddened beast. He is the true source of the bloody river that flows through Yardum. In life, he was truly a great hunter, a leader, and here he's a devastating opponent that attacks mindlessly, a shadow of his former self. He too delved into the labyrinth of Thumeru and brought back with him a moonlight sword that reeked of cosmic magic that supposedly spoke to him in his final days. When Ludwig has been harmed enough, he has a moment of clarity and he draws the sword, speaking to it as though it were truly aware, as though it were his teacher. He becomes more himself after this, now called the Holy Blade. He's more dangerous, more at ease. This would be unthinkable to the believers of the church to see such a mighty champion fall to this sort of insanity. Putting Ludwig down is a mercy he's perhaps unworthy of, but necessary to continue. But it's not so easy that he should die when his fighting ceases. The head of Ludwig still lives and he speaks. He speaks of his life, a thread of light that he once saw, a mystery that he never felt the need to understand, just to be near it. And then he starts to scream and laugh like he's a wild animal, like Beastood has returned to him. His clarity is gone, and he's disgusting. The hunter delivers the killing blow to Ludwig the Holy Blade, taking away from his body the Holy Moonlight Sword. The hunter is not alone here in the nightmare. There are others of sound mind and some who barely cling to sanity. Not all are outright hostile, yet some will do anything to kill the hunter and their elder guide on sight. The building atop where Ludwig resided is the research hall once used by the healing church, where vast and unspeakable experiments took place on the most vulnerable and sickly of Yarnum. Here in the nightmare, their bodies linger on to torment those deemed worthy of becoming a resident, namely, those of the church and the choir that performed the experiments in the waking world. That pendant that the hunter got from that flaming beast resting upon the altar is the key to ascending, an unorthodox elevator mechanism, but certainly a befitting one. But there's something under the elevator too. Before climbing higher, the hunter sends the lift up and waits for the second level of the rise to come up. There's a second altar underneath it, and upon it is the human skull of Lawrence the once pupil of Master Willem of Bergenworth, the founder of the Healing Church and the first of the Cleric Beasts. And the good hunter can put two and two together. That monstrosity laying upon the altar in the cathedral? That creature is Lawrence. In Yarnum, it was Lawrence's beast skull that rested there. This is his human skull hidden away here. How would the beast in the hunter's nightmare react when confronted with his human failure? Well, perhaps the good hunter will go pay the son of a bitch a visit before the night is through. Rising higher into the tower takes the hunter to the heart of the research facility, where the victims of the church's experimentations lurk in perpetual suffering. There are a few that have some semblance of sanity about them, that can carry out very simple conversations or offer prayers to nothing. They speak a name, Lady Maria, and raise their eyes towards a door high in the facility. One of them has on her person a key to a balcony. She's quite intelligent, recognizes that the hunter is not Maria, and makes very specific requests for brain fluid, a request that the hunter will not answer. What's happening to this woman is horrendous. What she wants is abominous. Without learning her name, her story, her end goal, the hunter ends this pitiable creature's life and takes the key from her corpse. Reaching the balcony door is a bit of an obstacle course. It requires reaching the height of the facility to rotate the middle pillar with the stairs attached. One has to wonder what the point of it is, if it was a mechanism to keep patients on their floors and containable to keep intruders from reaching certain areas, why not just use gates? But griping aside, the balcony door leads someplace very, very unexpected. Another lumen flower garden atop connecting buildings, with kin creatures once again, much like the garden before Ebrietus at the orphanage. But these are much larger creatures, and far more limited in number. These living failures were once people experimented upon to create emissaries that could reach out to great ones. This was the result of that. They worked together to kill intruders in their garden home and used cosmic abilities to beckon beautiful and deadly attacks from the sky. But their life forces are connected, shared between one another. When enough pain has been dealt out, they can no longer continue to recreate themselves and they fall as one, leaving behind another key.
to the great clock tower before the hunters. A woman sits in the grand clock tower, garbed in the attire of an old hunter, a pool of blood beneath her chair. She is unmoving to the hunter's approach. She rather seems like a corpse. But something about this, it just seethes danger. And when the hunter draws in too close, the woman grabs them and rather sweetly chastises them for meddling with a corpse. This is Lady Maria of Castle Canehurst, once a student of Bergenworth and a hunter in life alongside Germain, who deeply loved her and created the doll in her likeness after her suicide. Lady Maria partook in the culling of the fishing hamlet long ago, where the Great One, Koss, washed up on shore. The Bergenworth hunters killed all they could find within the hamlet and then desecrated the corpse of Koss and killed her child. They are why this hunter's nightmare exists, vengeance for Koss to punish them and future hunters for this act. Though Maria was disgusted by their actions, that did not free her from the wrath of Koss. When her life ended, she too passed into the nightmare. Here she guards a secret within the clock tower, intent on keeping curious minds away from it. Lady Maria has no intention of disclosing what it could be. She acts as a self-proclaimed warden of sorts, keeping the nightmare alive and well, perpetuating punishment against the hunters of Yarnum. Though what specifically she's guarding has yet to be revealed to the intruding hunters. Lady Maria is indeed a fine hunter and a savage combatant. Her years in the nightmare have not dulled her instincts or made her soft. She's dazzlingly fast and fights with blood rather than just using it. Even two hunters engaging her makes for an exquisitely difficult fray, as she's a constant aggressor and deals immense damage to those who lack attention. Killing Lady Maria here seems like such a terrible deed, but she's steadfast in acting as a guardian to what lies ahead. She does not want the existence of the nightmare to come under threat. There's no reasoning with her resoluteness, so Lady Maria is cut down. And she fades without a word. A celestial dial is left behind, and on it directions. Hold the dial up towards the astral clock to reveal a secret to its curious interloper. Doing so brings the clock back to life, its gears rotating to reveal a small passage forward. But where it leads to, it, it just doesn't make sense. Nothing about this makes sense. It's the fishing hamlet. A time unknown, but it's after the hunters committed their terrible atrocities. Still, they're cursed for it, called blasphemous, blood-crazed wretches that must atone. And as the hunters tread deeper into the hamlet, the words cease and the violence begins. The inhabitants attack on sight, a variety of dangers they bring with them. This nightmare will do all it can to keep intruders away from its source, away from the anchor of it. The fishing hamlet is a death trap to the unprepared, as it should be by all rights. The malformed residents bring as much pain as they receive, at times pushing the hunters into fleeing deeper into the village just to escape the mobs. The paths are hard to make sense of, and ways forward are locked shut, or paths just lead to hellhole dead ends. They eventually make it underground, through a series of caves that take them to the shore level. Down here, the residents of the hamlet are more like flailing slugs than actual humans. But traditional beasthood isn't here. This isn't physical change from old blood. It's from close proximity to Koss, the now dead Great One. And though she is gone, something most unusual is taking place in a cave underground. A large number of malformed villagers crowd a tunnel, but they're peaceful. They pay no mind to the hunter's approach. Their hands are folded as though in prayer. It's a rather peaceful scene. The hunter brings them no harm, instead passing through the crowd to see what they're worshiping. Her corpse is still there. The good hunter has heard the tale of this hamlet of Koss, though not in its entirety. This terrible sight is not a hard one to decipher. It's what those hunters of Bergenworth left behind so long ago. But what perhaps was not expected was that something was still living within the carcass of the Great One. Remember, Koss was with child. And here in this terrible nightmare, she tried to preserve the babe. She tried to save her child. So this is her orphan, the poor, wizened child. It's ugly, no? It suffers, yes. Think what one will of cause, but the orphan did not deserve this. To be shriveled, old, without guidance, carrying its own placenta out of the womb of its mother. This is the child of a great one, and now the hunter will put it out of its misery. 
Though it be a child, the orphan is feral, the most vicious opponent the hunters have yet faced. If it had been given a chance to be birthed, to grow, to become a proper great one, it would have been powerful, a true force of the cosmos. Now all it can do is scream and rampage towards them mindlessly. But through the trauma of combat and necessity, the orphan does change, becomes more than it was born as. There are beautiful aspects to this creature, such potential, so much power within it. The fight against the orphan is perilous and long, contained in a small area upon that shoreline near its mother's body. But at the fight's end, the orphan joins Koss in death. But this is not a terrible end that the two meet, no. Something most unexpected happens. The anchor for the nightmare is gone. The hunter's nightmare and all within will fade into nothingness soon enough. The dawn approaches, it will all be over soon. But severing the orphan from Koss frees it. The Great Ones are not so easily killed. Death in a human sense doesn't really apply to them. The sweet child of Koss returns to the ocean, freed from the limbo of this nightmare. And Koss herself, too, will leave this plane, hopefully reunited with her child, much like Yarnum and Mergo. With their exit, the moon vanishes, and dawn begins to break. But before leaving the Hunter's Nightmare for good, there is one last vendetta to see to. A particular beast lying upon a particular altar who was once a particular man that caused all of this pain and suffering. Lawrence. He's here in the nightmare. The hunter has his skull. Though he be mindless and wild, this is a personal issue that they wish to see to. He was the first of the cleric beasts, the first of the church to transform. Now he burns here eternally. One can only hope that there's enough left of Lawrence, the first Vicar, that he recognizes what's happening to him, that he knows he's being hunted, that he sees of himself what he became, and that he feels shame and regret for what he did in life. But if he can't, then at least he can take a good thrashing and feel some of the pain himself. Perhaps it is petty. Perhaps it's cruel. Perhaps it's unbecoming of a good hunter. But Lawrence is met out his serving of punishment at the hands of the duo hunters. With this errand complete, now it's time to go see Germen. Back in the hunter's dream, the tired old hunter sits beneath the great tree waiting. But something is brewing in the hunter's mind. Those umbilical cords. See, those were used to summon and create great ones with the intention of communing with them, with the intention to ascend. But the good hunter knows that something has bound Germen here. And though they may not like the man, it's another tether to this world. Another great one clinging to some unknown desire in the plane of man. So this is a gamble. Perhaps it will be disastrous, but the good hunter consumes all of their umbilical cord parts before going to seek Germen. They will summon a great one with the intention of destroying it and therefore the hunter's dream. But first, Germen. He's been here far too long, lived in service to the great one and the hunters of Yarnum. But he doesn't know the intention of this particular hunter who's done so much in their short time here. So he offers them a choice. Let him strike them down, which will return them to the waking world. Let them go home. Let them go back to life as before, at least until the next hunt calls to them. Or refuse. The hunter has no intention of letting this go. So they take the second option. They will not be returning to the waking world. And Garman takes issue with this. He believes them a lost thrall to the hunt. And as he's done countless times before, he rises to carry out part of his job. He will kill any hunter that refuses to leave the dream. Now, it's his time to hunt. Garman still fights with the brutality of the old hunters and the speed of a new one. Though age has clearly slowed him, just imagine how cruel it would have been to combat the first hunter in his prime. Even now, he's a terror. Garman doesn't bring flash or over-the-top eye candy into the fight. His movements are very deliberate, very intentional, focused, everything is done with a purpose. It's no wonder that the hunters of old that fell under his tutelage became such fine warriors. The two fight with all they have left as dawn continues to break. Not much longer does the knight have, but the first hunter does not survive this time. After all the years he's served as a prisoner and keeper of this place, finally Germen is given rest. But that won't mean anything. Should the Great One that controls this place be allowed to live, a replacement will be sought. This isn't the end of the Hunter's dream, and as expected, with their Warden dead, 
and after being beckoned by the completed umbilical cord, the moon presence descends, and the hunter approaches. Being in the presence of a Great One is something only a few humans have experienced. Each Great One longs for its own child, but they can never birth them and will use humans as surrogates to achieve this. The Moon Presence grabs the hunter and pushes its head against their body, but regardless of their intention, the good hunter possesses the ability to repel the Moon Presence. And this denial causes a complete tone shift from a semi-gentle approach to all-out aggression. The Moon Presence fears that it cannot dominate this creature and so it will tear it apart. Alongside the Elder Hunter that's accompanied them through the night, the final fight against the Great One begins. The final bane upon the city to end this terrible cycle of violence that began so long ago. The blood of Ebrietis will no longer support blood ministration. The blood saints of the church are all dead and gone. Bergenworth and Rom have passed into fable. Mergo and the Queen are gone from this plane. The Orphan of Kos by all rights returned to its mother in the cosmos. Even Castle Kanehurst is just a bad memory now. A clean slate once those addled with blood are put down. Perhaps with the destruction of the hunter's dream, a new age can begin, free from the old blood and free from insight. The moon presence fights like it's frightened, making runs at the hunter and swinging around in a way that's almost nonsensical, less of a godlike celestial creature and more of an animal caught in a trap. The thing is half rotted out, a far cry from the beauty of Ebrietis. Together, the Elder Hunter and the Fledgling bring down this final anchor, destroy the final dream, and dispatch Yarnum's last nightmare. Though their gamble paid off, things will not end so simply for the Good Hunter. A final goodbye, and the Elder Hunter is sent home to continue their hunt. But for the other, an unexpected fate. The nightmares of Yarnum are fading with the sunrise. Soon the hunts will end. Blood ministration is over and in time, it will all fade into the past like a bad dream. Perhaps. For the Good Hunter ascends, taking the form of a newborn Great One. But this child falls into the care of one with more humanity and kindness than most, the doll. The doll will take care of this new child, take care of this once Good Hunter. But what they grow into can only be decided by them. A protector of Yarnum? A protector of this world, a terror and a blight upon it, a neutral ascendant. Well, that's for them to decide. The night has ended. Dawn has broken. Remember the old adage in the ages to come, good hunters and people of these lands. Fear the old blood. By the gods, fear it. Fear it.